towards us, your generosity towards us. Uh, Lord, uh, help our hearts and our minds, our eyes, our souls to be captured uh, by you and the wonder of who you are and what you have created. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Please stand and let's worship together. Let's 
uh, confess our sins praying together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us by your Holy Spirit. Enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God cast our sin from us. And so with confidence, we come before the throne of God, confident of his love for us because of what, not what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. And so we gather here as a redeemed people to celebrate Jesus as our Redeemer. And so let's continue to worship uh, him in song.
Jesus, as we uh, come and we seek to receive from you, we put our, our trust and our hope in you, uh, the one who died for us, uh, the one who was raised from the dead, defeating uh, evil and sin and sickness, uh, the one who now reigns. Uh, so, Jesus, uh, bring uh, your reign among us as we continue in your name. Amen. Uh, please take a seat, and we're going to join together in prayer. breadth, length, and depth of your love for us, which extends to the people of the whole world that you made so creatively. How wonderful it is that you brought variety, color, vibrancy, and beauty to this earth. For you have been a generous and caring father who wanted to provide for your children. We are blessed with continents, countries, and areas that range from the high mountain to the deep ocean, the small rural village to the bustling city. All of this has been made perfectly, a loving gift to be experienced and lived to the full. Creator God, you have showered upon us all the resources we need for a fulfilling life including families and friends who love us, work and leisure that inspires us, and a faith that brings meaning and purpose day by day. We are truly thankful for all you have done and continue to do for us day by day. But above all, we are thankful for the gift of your Son, our Saviour, who was born in poverty, lived as one of us, was crucified like a criminal, and whom you raised from the dead, now reigning with you in glory, our Saviour King. Thank you for your immeasurable grace shown to us through him. Thank you that he has victory over the power of sin and death. Thank you that as we have been reminded over recent weeks, he is your only son. He is a friend of sinners. He is a servant of many. And he is our King and Savior. We praise you, Almighty God, for these truths and for the impact that they have on our lives. O oh, merciful God, the world needs to know your saving grace through Christ. We pray for all those affected by the war in Ukraine. As Putin becomes even more desperate, please stay your hand on him and prevent him from using nuclear arsenal. Give great wisdom to the leaders of the world as they navigate this dismaying and troubling time, and as they seek to find a way for Putin to save face and stop the war. Please give courage to the people of Russia as they start to understand the truth through the propaganda. As Putin seeks to re-establish the rule of orthodoxy in its places of origin, please may he come face to face with the Prince of Peace who he seeks to represent. Please prevent more bloodshed, we pray. Almighty God, ruler of all, in whose kingdom peace and righteousness abound, we pray for those who are in conflict. Take away prejudice, cruelty, and revenge. Grant that barriers which divide may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease through Jesus Christ, our mediator. Loving God, we bring before you the people of Iran, as they seek relief from unjust rule, give them courage, perseverance, and an ability to change the minds of the leaders 
acknowledging the rights of all their citizens to live in peace and harmony. We pray for protection for Christians in Iran, that they would know your presence with them and that they would be able to influence events by your grace. We pray for our country, for our leaders in all levels of government. As we approach our state election, may the candidates act with integrity, generosity of thought, and kindness of word. Give us wisdom to discern policies that will be for the good of all, not just our own situation. As our country continues to navigate the past, the present, and the future, in all our words and actions, may we seek your glory, speak with love, and act in grace. Lord God, bring us together as one, reconciled with you and reconciled with each other. You made us in your likeness. You gave us your Son, Jesus Christ. He has given us forgiveness from sin. Lord God, bring us together as one, different in culture, but given new life in Jesus Christ. Together as your body, your church, your people. Lord God, bring us together as one, reconciled, healed, forgiven, sharing you with others as you have called us to do. In Jesus Christ, let us be together as one. And for our congregation, Lord, we pray that you will continue to give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those around us. We pray for our neighbours at Baldwin Primary, for the residents of Faversham House, and for all the others with whom we have interaction. May they know your presence with them this day. And for those of our brothers and sisters who are currently suffering from physical or mental illness, grief, loss of employment, exhaustion or despair, we pray that they will find their consolation in you and that you would sustain them through this time of trial as you have promised. God, help us to place our confidence in Christ. When we want to despair, help us to rejoice. When we want to run from you, lead us to repentance. When we want to hide, establish our feet on the Lordship of Christ. Restore to us the certainty of Christ, crucified, raised, and seated with you in heaven. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us from the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, we're now going to hear from God's Word. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, I'm reading from Acts 2, 22 to 41. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up having freed him from death, okay. because it's impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope, for you will not abandon 
my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb was with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Lord Jesus, uh, Jesus God, raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sons sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, for your children, and for all who are far away, every one whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments, and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptised, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we heard uh, what happens when Jesus is established as the king. Uh, last week uh, we were talking about how Jesus is the servant of many, uh, how the, the way things work is, is Jesus is the one that serves us and Jesus leads us on a, a path of restoration through serving us. Uh, how Jesus is wanting us to be a people that uh, allow ourselves to be served by him. The, the grace and redemption, the forgiveness, the wholeness that he wants to bring to us. So I have a question as we look at this passage this morning. Who or what uh, does Jesus not serve? Uh, he, he, he serves us. He's outward focus. He, he, he serves others. He serves the Father. He serves the Spirit. He, he doesn't serve evil. He doesn't serve the purpose of sin uh, so, so when we, we look at this pyramid and we see Jesus at the bottom, the one thing that uh, is, is not under him is sin. The, the thing that sits under his feet that he crushes with his heel is Satan and Satan's purposes. And so we're, we're turning the pyramid upside down uh, this morning as we look at Jesus, the Savior King, uh, the one who is enthroned, the one who reigns in glory, the one who is our king. Now, as we look at uh, Jesus as king, uh, I thought it really appropriate to, to think about earthly kings and queens. This is the throne of Queen Elizabeth II. What does the king's, King Charles's throne look like? Does anyone know? You don't know because you haven't seen it. <laughs> Uh, you, you see, he's, he's had his accession uh, to being the king, uh, but he's not yet been coronated as king. A uh, little trivia question, how long was it between uh, Queen Elizabeth's accession and her coronation? 16 months is the answer. Uh, you've been paying attention to the news. I knew nothing of this uh, <laughs> prior to the last few months, but now I, I know. Uh, when, when she... Uh, died instantly, King Charles was king. 
uh, the, the session was the officially putting things in order. The coronation is the celebration. But at what point did he become king on the, on the death of the queen? Uh, why is this relevant to us? Uh, as Christians, uh, we, can, we find ourselves in the, this place of Jesus is uh, ascended king, but we haven't yet arrived at the full celebration. The full celebration happens when he comes again and he leads us and we celebrate in all fullness in heaven with him. But we, so, we find ourselves in this in-between sort of time. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, the king has not yet been crowned, uh, and we've not yet seen him sit on a throne, is because it's a period of mourning. But for us, should there be this period of mourning between uh, Jesus' death and resurrection and his returning again? Uh, not at all. Uh, but I think sometimes as Christians we can find ourselves stuck in mourning, shame, in inadequacy rather than beginning to celebrate who is the king. Uh, mourning over our sin, mourning over brokenness, uh, ashamed of who we are not uh, rather than who we might be. Uh, inadequate to get where we feel like God calls us to be and to do what he calls us to do. And so as Christians, I think we can sometimes feel like we're stuck in this in-between time. But unlike uh, the, the, the accession of King Charles to the coronation of King Charles, there's no in-between time for us as Christians. There is a celebration in fullness time, but there's a celebration now. And so what it looks like for Jesus to be on the throne in our hearts is joy. Joy deep in your hearts that wells out in celebration through, through your lips. And so as we gather on Sunday, that's one of the reasons we sing and we celebrate. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. We're not waiting then until uh, the big celebration to receive the Holy Spirit. We've been given the Holy Spirit now. And as the Holy Spirit works in us, joy is the product. And so when we find ourselves stuck in this kind of in-between, this mourning, shame, and inadequacy, we, we, we need to ask ourselves this question, what, who or what is on the throne in our lives? Who or what is on the throne in our lives? Sometimes our problems can be on the throne in life. Uh, you catch up with someone and you talk about them, and all they ever talk about is this problem. Uh, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a thing. Uh, when all we talk about is problems, it's usually a case that problems are begin to enthrone themselves on our heart. Now, as Christians, that the place uh, where Jesus is to be enthroned is, is our hearts, uh, is our minds, is our souls, is the whole of ourselves. So problems can't take that place because that's the place that's designed for Jesus. What about other people? Uh, are you crushed uh, by what someone says uh, really easily? Maybe people are on the throne in your heart. Uh, is your life driven by the agendas of other people? Maybe people are on the throne of your heart. I think the biggest problem that we face today is uh, ourselves being on the throne. Back in the time of Egypt, idols were physical things people made out of wood and worshipped, which sounds really funny to us. Uh, but they would look at us and wonder why we worship ourselves as we make idols of uh, aesthetically uh, our own agendas. Uh, we can enthrone ourselves in our lives and become our own king. So who or what is on our throne? As Christians, we can sometimes find ourselves overly concerned with what actually sits under Jesus' feet. You see, Jesus serves us as our King. Jesus serves us in bringing us redemption, in bringing us wholeness, uh, in bringing us joy, in sending the Spirit, but that doesn't mean He sits under us. See, Jesus... Uh, is enthroned and we're called to have him established as the king in our lives. And what does that mean that we 
honor him for the position that he's in. We live our life in a way that aligns with his kingly purposes, knowing that in his love for us, he serves us. And his service is not uh, in uh, contradiction to his kingship. But as Christians, uh, we can sometimes see problems, people, ourselves on the throne. And sometimes sin sits on the throne. And these things can drive us when actually these things are meant to sit under Jesus' feet. Now, we talk a lot about uh, sin often in church. But we should also talk about problems. You see, sometimes the problems and the, the burdens of life sit in this place where they overwhelm us. So when problems are overwhelming us, who's on the throne? The, the problem sits on the throne. What are we not believing about Jesus? That he actually sits above the problem or the pain of our life. So if Jesus sits above the problem or the pain of our life, and that's beneath his feet, who's in charge? Jesus is. Who's going to deal with it? Jesus is. Who's going to deal with evil? Jesus is. Is And so, as Christians, we need to see Jesus as the king. Uh, we have a king in Jesus, and so the question uh, for our hearts, is that good enough? Is that good enough for me? Is that good enough for you? And when I live in, when I live in a way, because you're not the only people that struggle with having Jesus as king, I have my own agendas and plans, when I live in a way that doesn't show Jesus to be my king, I experience the fruit of myself as not such a great king. As Christians, uh, we need this to continually uh, examine our lives and our hearts so that Jesus will be enthroned in the place that he bought by the price of his blood. In the Bible, we learn of the problem of earthly kings. Uh, we, we see in verse 29, uh, it says, Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, and you can find this on page 886 of your pew Bibles, I, I say confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and he was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. What's the point of the, what he's saying here? The, the point is that, that David was a king. He was a good king, the best of kings. But he died and was buried and his tomb is there. What's one of the problems with earthly kings? Their reign finishes. Jesus' reign is eternal. There's a difference. Uh, but David, uh, as a prophet, pointed our forward to a king that will come. God promised that there would be a king on the throne of David, and this king is Jesus. Earthly kings uh, struggle to deliver what our messianic king delivers in the full. Uh, the problem of earthly kings is David and Bathsheba. Uh, there's plenty of other David incidents that we can mention uh, where David uh, failed to live up uh, to the measure of what he was called to live up to as king. Every other king, it's the story of a good king, a bad king, a good king, a bad king, the one that did good things in God's sight, the one that did evil things in God's sight, the, one, the king that followed in the footsteps of his father who did evil things, the king that brought reform. And continually kings uh, go in this cycle of never being quite adequate enough. And so the problem of earthly kings is inadequate kings produce inadequate Results. So no earthly king, even ourselves, can produce the result in even our own kingdom that is going to be long-term, lasting, generational, spiritual prosperity. So the solution is God as our king. You, you, you know, when you look at the Old Testament and the people are saying, give us a king like all the other nations, uh, God gives them a king. But what he really wanted of them was for him to be established as the king among them. And so every earthly king points to a heavenly king that can fulfill what we want in an earthly person. 
Well, the human problem uh, we see in this passage, verse 36, if you're following along, so it's page 886, uh, we see in verse 36, Therefore let the entire uh, house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's speaking to the audience and he's saying actually God has made him uh, the Lord, the King. The he is the Messiah, the, the coming one who you expected to save you. God has made him this and yet you crucified him. So, this, so the human problem is a struggle to discern the true king. Uh, the struggle to discern what it looks like to sit under Jesus as uh, our king. And so we, we live in this place where we actually need God to help us for this task of him being established in us as the king of our hearts. And so if you've received the Holy Spirit as, you, as you've come as a Christian, one of the things that the Holy Spirit wants you to do is embrace Jesus as your king. One of the Holy Spirit is going to one of the things the Holy Spirit is going to do as we seek to follow Jesus is establish Jesus as king in our hearts. And what does that mean? Our problems need to get off the throne. We need to get off the throne. Other people need to be dethroned themselves so that Jesus may take his rightful position in each of our hearts. So why would I want Jesus as my king? Uh, I'm going to put some verses up on the screen and you can also follow them in scripture. And one of the things I want you to understand as I'm putting the verses up on the screen is that as uh, the scripture talks about Jesus, what has been done for Jesus is done for us. What is true of Jesus that is true of us. So when Jesus is sitting on the throne, we are kept in heaven with him. We are with Jesus on the throne. We, you are here seated now. Uh, simultaneously, you are also seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms. Now, that's hard to wrap our human minds around, but what is true of Jesus is true of us. And so we can read these verses, and with confidence we can know that they speak about what is true for us because Jesus is on the throne for us and we are established with him. That is, he is ascended king. We don't need to wait for the celebration to know this is a reality for us. So verse 25, I will not be shaken, though the whole world is shaken around me because Jesus is on the throne, I will not be shaken. The life may fall apart. I will not be shaken because Jesus is on the throne. Verse 26, uh, my, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Glad hearts. Glad hearts. Uh, verse uh, 28, those who are full of gladness in your presence. As the Holy Spirit works in you, it should produce a gladness in you. That you are redeemed. We are a redeemed people. We're no longer defined by our past, by our problems, by evil uh, that we have done or others have done. We are a redeemed people that should produce gladness in our hearts and that Jesus sits above all the problems, all the evil, all the pain in this world that should bring gladness in our hearts so that even when we are sorrowful, we can be a people that rejoice in fullness because Jesus is king and so our tongues rejoice the fruit of hearts that are glad is lips that rejoice and so we sing and celebrate Jesus as our king and so our flesh lives in hope although outwardly we are wasting away we live in hope that we've been renewed day by day and that there is a resurrection body waiting for all of us and so our flesh lives in hope that though outwardly we groan we have been renewed as God's people because Jesus is king. Uh, we have verse 27, hope that uh, we will not be abandoned. Verse 27 speaks uh, of how uh, Jesus, uh, though he went and dealt with death and evil, his, his body did not see decay. It speaks of him, but also speaks of us. Though we will die, 
Though one day our mortal bodies will die, death is not our end. Life is our end because Jesus is our King. And so we can look to Jesus as our King with confidence, knowing that He not only has our present but our future beyond this earth in His hands. Uh, Verse 28, uh, you've made known to me the ways of life. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So as we look to Jesus, we're, we're confident that he will lead us in the ways that produce life in us and life around us. With Jesus as our, our king, uh, we're full of gladness uh, with your presence. That is, God is present with us. People used to have to go to the temple to meet with God. And only certain people could go and meet with God. But Jesus isn't an inaccessible king. He gives audience to us because he is present with us. And so our hearts are glad that we can not just know from a distant our king. And most earthly kings are distant from most people. But we can know him up close, personal. He loves us. He's our king. He's present with us. Verse uh, 33, uh, we receive the promised Holy Spirit. That is, Jesus says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We're confident that he is with us. And I wonder, where's the greatest army established? It's always with the king. On earth, the the role of an earthly army is to defend at all costs the king. (laughs) So who's present with us? The king. He's eternally establishing his reign and so we can be confident that whether life or death nothing can separate us from the love of God we're confident verse 35 that uh, all enemies will be a footstool under his feet that he's dealt with it and one day he will finally that the, the power of sin and evil is dealt with the presence of one day will be gone and there'll be no more tears and no more mourning because Jesus is king. Verse 36, uh, he's the promised Lord and Messiah. That is, he's fulfilled uh, the Old Testament. He's come and he's established the reign that the rest of this book looks forward to. And so we can look to him as the, the one true king who will reign forever. The one that will bring salvation to all of his people. And then verse 38, we we see that he's actually the one that offers forgiveness. No matter the treachery, no matter the evil, no matter the brokenness, Jesus offers forgiveness to you and to me that we will be restored to a place of safety and security and wholeness under him as our king. He has good for us. And so these are usually when, when I talk about uh, a, a theme, I will go outside scripture. And we could come up with lots more things as we look through the scripture, the kingship of Jesus. But just here, we see all this is true for us as Jesus is the king in our lives. So, who is Jesus' kingship for? Verse 39, for the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. This promise of Jesus' kingship is good news for the world, and this promise is for us, for our children, and for all who are far away. See, the good news of our king is, is that he wants to be the good king for the whole earth. And a day will come when every knee will bow, every person will see that Jesus is actually the king. Uh, But in the meantime, we're given this beautiful privilege of representing the king on this earth and pointing people to the king who has been good to us. Now, the human problem, we struggle to recognize Jesus as our king God's solution, living letters, living testimonies, transformed 
uh, by his blood shed, his body broken, and his resurrection life. So what's the pattern of the people that follow Jesus as king? We see it in verse 42, and this is the pattern that the disciples of Jesus have been following uh, ever since he ascended king. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So we gather as God's people, we... (laughs) devote ourselves to study scripture because we we know in it we will discover the fullness of who god is and he brings transformation we gather together and encourage one another because we know that's part of how god has wired us as his people we break bread together and we're, we're going to do that uh this morning after the service we're going to share lunch and uh, I'll give you an opportunity to tell me if you would like to come for lunch but haven't previously identified it and we'll make sure there's enough for everyone. And then the prayers. We, we've prayed and we continue to pray as we gather and that's the pattern of God's people. When we think about what church should look like, verse 42 is a clear picture from Scripture of what church looks like both then and today. So the question for each of us is, who is my, who is your king? What's on the throne of my heart? Is it my problems? Is it sin? Is it evil? Is it other people? Is it even myself? Is it a challenge? Is it my work? Is it money? Is it power? Is it sex? What's on the throne for me? And what do I need to do to see Jesus established on his throne in my heart once again. Scripture puts it really simple for us. It says this, repent and believe. What does that mean? Repent, turn away from other kings and believe. Jesus is the one true king who has good for you. Let me pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, you are our king. Uh, Lord, as we come before you, uh, we'd like to ask your forgiveness for having other kings. You might like to just say in your own words, uh, Jesus, forgive me for looking to other kings. Jesus, I establish you as the king of my heart. I repent of my sin and turn to you and believe that you are the only king for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let me invite you to stand. Uh, w- w- one of the ways we remind our hearts is by speaking words out. So please stand, and we're going to declare our faith uh, with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Uh, Let's uh, sing of Jesus as our King. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from the throne of endless glory. Jesus on 
our throne in our hearts is with our money. And so the next song is our offertory song. We use a box at the front and the back. And so let me encourage you to give uh, generously towards the work of God's church. Let's continue in song. Thank you uh, for these gifts uh, given, uh, both electronic, in person, uh, towards your kingdom. We pray, uh, Lord, as we establish you as uh, our king, Lord, that you uh, will bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to take a brief seat, uh, I'll share with you a few things coming up with church. Our, our monthly news uh, will come out probably on Monday uh, via email, and there'll be a copy for you to pick up uh, next week. Uh, you can thank our federal government for an extra public holiday. For the <laughs> that made a very difficult short week. Uh, we are starting soon. I'm still waiting for one or two more people to join us uh, for... Uh, a course on evangelism that is helping us to not only know our faith, be able to explain it and give testimony to it clearly to others. Uh, where if you sign up to the course, uh, I'm not requiring you to go out and to be a street evangelist. What I'm expectant of what this course will do for us is it will give us confidence in what we believe and confidence if we feel like sharing it. Uh, maybe you will be bold, maybe you won't. That's not a requirement to come to the course. So speak to me as I'd like to start this in the, the next couple of weeks so uh, that we can get into being uh, God's, uh, understanding our faith and, and being witnesses to that in the way that God has prepared for each of us. Uh, we are on the 9th of October uh, launching our history. Uh, it's had lots of work and lots of updates and we've meshed together a whole bunch of things and we're going to have John Butler mailing, uh, the mailing family built half a ball and who's going to be talking and, and giving us some history as well. And so if you would like to come to that afternoon on the 9th of October, uh, we are wanting you to sign up at a sign-up sheet either in that foyer or, or this foyer uh, as we celebrate 150 years. Uh, we are doing a trivia night on the 22nd of October 
I'll send out uh, Monday to you a picture so you can start inviting friends. And for next weekend, we'll have a, a flyer that you can give to someone. We'd love you to either put together a table or, or uh, talk to us about uh, coming along so that we can uh, plan for numbers. And it should be a great night. We're supporting uh, poverty in uh, Sri Lanka and through Anglican Overseas Aid. And so we'd love for you to come and bring some people along to that night. It's a great night to invite friends along to. Uh, Kirsty is going to uh, the Women's Convention. And there's a couple of great speakers. And if you would like to hear Erica or Safina uh, speak, uh, there'll be great encouragement. Speak to Kirsty, or you can find out more details about the Women's Conference up there on the Belgrave Heights website. Uh, Saturday to come, who's going to be around for a working bee? <laughs> ABC. <laughs> there we go. Um, maybe we might delay it one week to the, potentially, to the 8th, because I'm not around for next Saturday. Uh, so we have uh, Kirsty next week is going to be leading and preaching. So I've got a, a weekend off with the family, taking the kids away for a few days. So uh, one thing to remember when you're turning up for church uh, next week is, uh, what do we do in spring? We spring forward. Uh, so your clock... Uh, springs forward so you lose an hour's sleep. So if you turn up an hour late to the 9 o'clock service, you'll be plenty early for 10.30. If you turn up an hour late for 10.30, you'll be ready for coffee and tea. So <laughs> I make sh most people will have clocks that do this, but just a reminder that starts uh, for next Sunday. Uh, so as we go out, I pray that, that Jesus would establish himself through his Holy Spirit as King in your lives, that you would have increased discernment and understanding how you can live in partnership with him, and that you would understand and experience the blessing of what it means that he is your King. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. And if you are wanting to